An insidious aura, an overwhelming presence so strong that when you're in his vicinity, all you see is your own demise. The quelling of you and any of your allies who come to face him. A mastermind who has set up pieces on a chessboard 16 years in advance. That is, until the third act. This intimidating villain has now been reduced to a Saturday morning cartoon villain who lacks any sort of on-screen presence, now lacks any of the supposed intellect and foresight we are to expect from him, and ends up taking the spotlight from an actually good antagonist, all while bending and breaking the plot with each important scene he's in, making the narrative feel nonsensical. Why are so many people, myself included, no longer fond of the once all-powerful All for One? All for One, or AFO for short, quickly fell from the ranks as a once legendary character to now being probably bottom two, if not the worst character in the entire series for myself personally. Up until the third act of the story, one of MHA's strongest characteristics was not only its villains, but its fantastic character writing. MHA's character moments are when it's at its best, as evidenced by the more recent Endeavor chapters. Its characters are generally insanely consistent, to a very pleasing degree, as we get moments like Deku's highlights in the war, that were teased and built up from the very beginning of My Hero Academia. Character moments that all blend together to deliver as highlights, like Bakugo taking a stabbing for Midoriya at the very peak of his own atonement arc, or Dobby doing his grand reveal at a climax of the entire Todoroki family subplot. MHA's villains are no exception to this rule, with characters like Shigaraki and Dobby who have this strong, consistent characterization that makes us extremely excited to see what they have to offer when they're on screen, and give us some of the strongest moments in recent My Hero Academia. And this is exactly what I despise about All From One. He breaks MHA's mold of consistency, characters that bleed deeply into the themes of the series, that build up to these massive character moments due to their strong on characterization or character moments, and of course, characters that don't bend the will of the plot to their own will. All for one, fucking sucks. For all of these reasons. Let's start from the beginning. We were always under the impression throughout MHA that there was someone behind the scenes, supporting Shigaraki from the shadows. He slowly built up over three seasons, and in the second season, we learn of All Might's almost career-ending fight with the man known as All for One, where he had assumed that he had killed him. Finally, in the climax of the first act, we get this amazing scene of the kids feeling nothing but fear in his presence, and seeing visions of their own deaths. He walks out of the shadows, blasts away every pro hero in his vicinity with one shot, and just floats there, as this incredible song plays. All for One's intro into the story was one of the strongest in the entire series. He destroys the entire surrounding area, instills dread into all of those in his vicinity, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with our power ceiling, and reveals a grand twist of Tomura Shigaraki being the grandson of Nana Shimura. He is then narrowly defeated by All Might, and keeping up with MHA's thematic emphasis on the next generation and passing the torch, he leaves it all to Tomura as he's carted off to prison. This was fantastic. He spends some time beyond this in prison being a troll and pissing off All Might, but other than that, all for One was a fantastic character, extremely well utilized. Then unfortunately, the final act of MHA arises. All for One returns and he just kinda sucks. All for One is now just a caricature of the mastermind villain trope. We get reveal after reveal of him being involved in something and that's just like, yeah, okay I get it. Your hand is in every single cookie jar in the universe. But for the sake of structure, let's break the rest of this video down into three segments. One, mastermind or is he? Two, nothing character. And three, plot inconsistencies. For the first two acts of the story, we're all told about how All For One is a genius, and during those two acts, that's seemingly true. He runs a criminal organization in the shadows. He knows exactly how to manipulate people to do his bidding. He is so adept at covering his tracks that he is only known as a rumor on the internet. He knew exactly how to strike at All Might's heart and groomed a symbol of terror specifically to get back at him, and his amazing intellect foresaw that the best course of action was to take the fall in the Kamino arc. The problem with this mastermind facade, much like the rest of his character, arises in Act 3. This character who has supposedly been making great decisions for over a hundred years, fumbles it all in rapid succession. The more we learn about AFO, the less I'm able to believe in his intellect, and in his dreadful presence. The consistency of his character wavers. The Vigilante spin-off book reveals to us that he was quite intelligently going after Shota Aizawa's Quirk of Erasure, an incredibly powerful tool to have in his arsenal. But the plan fails, and he instead ends up killing Shirakumo, or who we know now as Kurogiri. The problem comes with the fact that Vigilantes was simply an afterthought for both Aizawa and AFO. AFO's plan to get Erasure failed, so... Why did he just stop? He has one failed attempt, snaps his fingers, and goes, OG oh, Willikers, I guess that's that. Let's move on and take search instead in six years. For a character who states that when he sees a good quirk, he can't help but take it, he gave up pretty quickly on the power that should have instantly nullified every single adversary he comes across. Imagine if he had a razor in his rematch with All Might, or even in his desire to take New Order, a quirk he claims he has always coveted, but apparently a razor wasn't on that list. This is, I believe, due to, like I said before, Vigilante's not really being in the outline, and Horikoshi might 
might have had all these plans for the Aizawa backstory, but they weren't in the main story. But by putting ink to a page, it's now canonized and just makes All for One look kind of stupid. This isn't his only quirk related blunder. No, in fact, there are three more that stand out quite significantly. The first one is despite Chisuki being right in front of him, he did not take the overhaul quirk. This is something that I will be getting back to much more substantially in the third part of this video, so I'm going to go ahead and put it on the back burner for now. The immediate next fumble is that he, for some reason, just doesn't have hyper regeneration. Him and the doctor handed this out to Nomu like it was crack, and he even gave it to Shigaraki, but I guess it didn't occur to the demon lord who would have won his second match with All Might if he had it. Before I get the inevitable comments saying, it doesn't heal wounds from before it's obtained, yes, I am aware it doesn't mean it wouldn't be useful for him to have. Initially, I just suspended my disbelief, and thought that maybe he just didn't account for having to go out there and fight again until his Shigaraki meat suit was ready. But after having MHA spend months and months trying to tell me that this guy is a genius, it makes it impossible for me to continue believing that this dude didn't account for literally everything. A guy who was a backup plan for a backup plan, and wasn't even concerned with the idea of Aoyama getting caught. Again, it all just kind of circles back to the I can't help but take it panel. Apparently, he can't help it since he stopped pursuing Erasure and Super Regeneration despite how useful they both would be, and one of those literally being in his quirk lab. The third incident that leaves me confused now is AFO's refusal to take Best Genius quirk during Kamino. He said he wouldn't take it because it's not a quirk that suits Tomura. Yet, with future context, we know that this was a load of bullshit, as he is actually using Shigaraki as a meat suit. Best Genius quirk is, at worst, pretty good, and even if he didn't want to keep it for himself, he could pass it off to somebody else who would want it, or even use it to modify clothes for his capitalist agenda. After having this dude is really smart be shoved down my throat by Horikoshi for months, looking at all these massive fumbles in the span of a year in-universe makes it extremely hard to believe. These events do not make a good mastermind, but they do make a... When All for One wasn't really in the focus and he simply acted as this imposing presence that mirrors All Might's simple idea of heroism, he was a pretty strong character. You don't need to be insanely layered or deep to be a good character, you just need to fulfill your purpose in the story. He was a very scary character who fulfilled the idea of a comic book villain perfectly. The problem arises, however, when he usurps actually interesting characters to become the primary antagonist of My Hero Academia. All for One, as mentioned previously, is a comic book villain, and All Might is a comic book hero. But Tomura Shigaraki is somebody who holds deep disdain for a society that is capable of producing somebody like himself. Somebody who, despite wanting to destroy everything, still cares deeply for his friends and everything that they love, and the people he surrounds himself with. He grows into his own from being a bratty manchild to being a competent leader, who can utilize ideology to grow his cause, becoming the ultimate symbol of fear. And then he gets body jacked. While the narrative obviously has its reasons for body jacking Shigaraki, such as teasing him with liberation for the first time, only to then have his freedom stripped away from him once again, at the time of writing, it has been almost two real-life years since Shigaraki has been himself, or almost 100 chapters. The deeply interesting, symbolic, and thematically relevant character has been put on the back burner after he finally gets to be his own villain in favor of somebody who stands for and represents almost nothing at the very tail end of the series. This decision wouldn't be that big of a deal if All for One wasn't the big bad, or if it weren't the, in the final arc of the series. But instead, we're robbed of one of MHA's best characters for almost 100 chapters now. It also feels like that Horikoshi is aware that All for One cannot fill the shoes of the primary antagonist left by Shigaraki, so he tries to give him a new motivation right at the very end of the series, which leaves a significant amount to be desired. In chapter 343 of a series reaching its conclusion, the primary antagonist gets a motivation, and it's about becoming a capitalist, holding a monopoly on production-related quirks so that he can produce the resources the world needs, so the globe must turn to him for support. Not a bad goal by itself, it could actually be quite interesting if it wasn't shoehorned into the final fight after AFO takes the spotlight. I personally preferred when Alpha one and All Might were both two mentors passing the torch to the next generation, as their simplistic, one-dimensional ideas of heroism and villainy would no longer suffice in a world so deeply nuanced. For both Toshinori and AFO to be supporting their successors from the sidelines, powerless to do anything. Midoriya, Class 1A, and the world aren't ready for All Might's retirement, just as Shigaraki and the League of Villains aren't ready for All for One to get carted off the prison. Midoriya is thrust into a world without All Might, and the PLE arc immediately shows this newfound independence as he is forced to develop his own fighting style, after copying his from All Might. The same can be said for Shigaraki Shigaraki in the overhaul arc, as he's thrust into a world without AFO and forced to develop his own leadership style and underhanded tactics to get by as this world's next symbol of fear. This passing of the torch theme feels heavily undermined as AFO rears his ugly head once more to take control over Shigaraki. The dynamic between Midoriya and Shigaraki, one that hinges almost entirely on parallels, is severely damaged because of this. They share other similarities, of course, but it was all about being left out on their own in a crumbling world without their respective masters. Watching them both grow into their own hero and villain alongside each other after their guiding hands 
shades are removed is something incredibly satisfying to read or watch, and heavily informs the duality of these characters. This is all undermined once again when Offer One takes the spotlight. The spotlight being cast on him reveals just how repetitive and uninteresting his one-note nature is. A plan seems to fall through, Offer One reveals either a contingency plan or that it was the plan all along, rinse and repeat for the third act. When you know that this dude has plans upon plans, the reveal that he has a plan is not interesting. It has in fact removed all presence this character had, not just for the reader, but for our characters too. In Act 1, the kids were too scared to even move around him, but in Act 3, everyone is quite easily mobilized to attack him. He doesn't provide that same image of death that he used to. All of this brings up the biggest worry I have about All For One's character. And no, it's not Dad For One despite how terrible that is. I don't think Horikoshi would stoop that low. His sudden inclusion into the primary antagonist role brings about the fear of the narrative making defeating All For One the goal of fixing everything. If All For One is responsible for everything, we can just pin all of society's problems on him and when he goes down, everything is better now. Don't mind the heteromorph discrimination, flawed court counseling, lack of social safety nets, and the murderous public facilities. Again, this is just a worry that I have. It doesn't mean that the story is going to outright do this, and it's very possible that this does not happen. But it's not like it would be new for a character who is known for... This is the section that is most frustrating to me. These are not only horrendous character-related decisions, but also ones that would completely bend the story and become immediately apparent as soon as Act 3 kicks off and he is reintroduced. As mentioned previously, why didn't he take Best Genius Quirk? Now that we know he was just trying to body jack Shigaraki, it makes absolutely zero sense to not take such a powerful quirk from somebody. This again, is not the only time AFO missed an extremely powerful quirk right before his eyes, however, as he was standing inches away from the leader of the Shiehe Saikai leader, Kai Chisaki, better known by his quirk name, Overhaul. Overhaul is probably in the top 10 most powerful quirks of the series. It was just wielded by a dipshit. You have the power to reinvent things, to organize matter however you wish. Overhaul is capable of fully fusing and restoring people to their near prime. AFO not taking Overhaul is not only a massive slap in the face to his supposed intelligence, it completely undermines his goals and pretty much everything that occurs after Villain Hunt, because none of it should be happening. AFO wants to body jack Shigaraki because his body is failing and he wants to, the rage to take one for all. So why not either? One, use Overhaul to restore your main body to its near prime, undoing most of the damage you've taken. Two, use Overhaul to fuse yourself with Shigaraki so that you have the best of both worlds and achieve the goal you were trying to get with the surgery. Three, use Overhaul to reorganize and produce entirely new materials, which fits exactly in line with your half-baked, randomly introduced goal of capitalist ownership. Four, use Overhaul because it is absurdly powerful and is capable of one-shotting anybody you touch. And five, just don't take it despite it filling everything you desire to a T and making you look like a fucking idiot and not even close to the mastermind the narrative wants to portray you as. There are usually usually three counter-arguments to AFO taking overhaul, all of which are headcanons and have no actual standing in the story. Number one is that AFO didn't know who Chisiki was. This idea is more or less immediately undermined by a page turn or two, when Offer One recognizes him and says not only his full name, but his title in the role of the Shia Hisaikai. This genius mastermind clearly knew who he was, and I assume his quirk. If he didn't know his quirk, well if we take the movies as canon, which everybody on Earth including Hori wants to tell me that they are, then Offer One had access to a scanner quirk that literally tells the wielder people's quirks. Seems like something a mastermind should have when you have the quirk all for one. Number two is that AFO doesn't like complex quirks. This is something that has been said to me countless times when I call this into question, and here's the thing. This has never been stated. Never has AFO ever said that he doesn't want complicated quirks. He said that in the context of gathering quirks for Tomura Shigaraki in the Kamino arc, which we also now know with future context is bullshit. It's also just flat out wrong, seeing as how in the Vigilante spinoff he stole the Overclock quirk, and in the Stars and Stripes mini arc he was going after New Order, which reads like a JJK power. A more complex issue is that Overhaul is never stated to be a complex power. It isn't ever stated to be simple either, it's just never elaborated on. The idea that Overhaul is hard to use is a complete headcount. Canon. The implication that Overhaul needs to have a deep understanding of the molecular structure of something that he touches is absurd, and is never demonstrated in-universe, as he can clearly use his power on just about anybody or anything, like random parts of the stone flooring in the Overhaul arc. The third counter-argument is that AFO cannot take new-gen quirks. This, much like the prior point, has no grounding in the actual story. It is clear that AFO is weak after his first encounter with All Might, and that might be impacting the limit of the amount of quirks he can hold, but it is never once stated that he cannot take new generation quirks. It's actually immediately disproven because he took Ragdoll's quirk, who isn't that much older than Chisaki and is feasibly in the same generation as him. Let's just give it to them, however, and assume that it is true that AFO is limited to what quirks he can take. Even if this were the case, Shigaraki, the guy made to be a stronger, more modern version of All for One, who also has the original version of the quirk, is literally right there, and is body jacked by AFO. If we circle back to the first point of AFO not knowing who Chisaki is, Shigaraki does. He has personally fought him and his group. 
he knows what his quirk is capable of, has used its product, and could take overhaul to use on AFO or to further AFO's goals. There is no way to spin the AFO Chisuki thing in a positive light. It is a fundamental flaw in not only AFO's goals, but his supposed intelligence. That's why when people tell me it's not a big deal, I can't help but disagree. It is a glaring issue with our primary antagonist. That's enough about Chisuki, though. Let's get in how all for one turned the concept of quirk vestiges into absolute fucking nonsense. Our previous understandings of vestiges were that they were the souls of other quirk factors that get transplanted. You could converse with them, and in a singular instance, they were capable of just moving Midoriya's fingers for him when he was brainwashed. The only people really capable of these interactions were people that could gather multiple quirks, like one for all, all for one, or the few people that were bestowed with multiple by AFO. That's pretty much where it ended. AFO's reintroduction, however, greatly expanded the capabilities of what a vestige can do. When for the first First time, the vestiges of AFO's stolen quirks start fighting back. You might read that in the manga, stop and think, wait, they can do that? In the following chapter, we learn that due to the fact that he is wielding a copied version of Offer One, his hold on the other vestiges was weaker, letting them hold a rebellion inside of the vestige realm. Copied quirks are a factor of the story that we know almost nothing about despite being in the final stretch. It's essentially just quirk magic. This of course begs the question, why has this never happened before? Monsters who are quite literally hodgepodges of copied quirks like the Nomu have never experienced a quirk rebellion. Anybody like Nine, who has copies of quirks, has never experienced a quirk rebellion. All for One, in his second massive fight with All Might, where he had the copy of All for One, did not experience a quirk rebellion, despite that being the exact time he swapped out the quirks. Why now, in the final fight, do we experience this massive contrivance for the first time? The first theory is that New Order was responsible for this, but All for One himself states that this isn't true. The second theory is that seeing all these extras rise up against the Demon Lord spurred them to action, which makes me think, was All Might really not good enough for them? If they rebelled then, they might have been able to kill All for One that time, or at least make the fight significantly easier. Why do vestiges even need to be spurred into action? What is the consequence for a spirit rebelling? He might bite you with his big, comically large mouth? In the worst case, he destroys you, which actually is a victory for you since, well, you're not a person, and also you weaken the Demon Lord by destroying a quirk that you've been stuck with for hundreds of years. <sighs> okay. It's all out of my system now. It's frustrating being told that I'm crazy for not liking AFO, or being called just a hater. This nutsack goes against his own characterization constantly in the third act, usurps better characters and offers nothing to the narrative, all while actively damaging it and introducing nonsensical factors and making himself look like an idiot every single time he has panel time. All for one is the exact opposite of consistent, and that's exactly what I hate about him. This video was written and recorded just as we see all for one pull rewind out of his ass, which has the potential to be even more stupid, but I'll bite my tongue until we see the rest. I hope I've been able to properly demonstrate to you why I think All For One has had one of the biggest fall-offs of the series, and why I groan every time this dude is on screen. That's my All For One rant. It's been work- it's been in the pipeline for a few weeks, right? I, I fucking hate this dude. If you like this video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. Uh, in the description you can find my Twitter and my Discord, so please feel free to follow me on Twitter and join the Discord down below. We talk about MHA, ReZero, and Jujutsu Kaisen and stuff like that. And that's about it. Thanks for watching. See ya.